Hey, good morning. Glad to be here back on campus at Southern Seminary and Boys College. What an honor and uh, what a joy because, uh, Dr. Moeller, every time I walk on the campus, I just feel like I'm coming home. And I don't know if it's because I'm old now. You know, I was young when I met you. I was 22 when I walked onto the campus in 1993 for the first time and got to meet you and begin to fall in love with what God was doing here. And now I'm 50. And uh, I, I, I saw yesterday some moms out here and they had like their, uh, you know, you guys have that uh, thing, they, it's a belly backpack, you know, for a baby. I don't know what you call that thing because we didn't have it. But they're walking around these uh, babies and little kids running around in double strollers. And it just took my mind back to, you know, Kristen and I have walked this campus so many afternoons because when you're broke, you just need a place to walk, you know. And we would walk around this campus and raise those children and now to have one of them here as a student and our other kids growing up and just to get to come back, it's almost overwhelming and it makes me emotional. And so I could almost, like we were sitting here singing that last hymn, and I could almost not sing because I was kind of getting, uh, start, I don't know, something was in my eye. And I don't know if it's when you get 50, I don't know if it's like your estrogen levels just elevate. I, I don't know what it is. But um, it's just really, really, really amazing to be here. And I'm grateful to be here. And I hope you are too. Let, let me just see who's in the room though. Uh, how many of you are students at Boyce College? Would you raise your hand? You are students at Boyce College. All right. I see the Bulldogs. How many of you are students at Southern Seminary uh, at, at the master's level or higher? There you go. Right. How many of you are faculty or staff in the room? Uh, faculty, staff in the room. All right. So it's about a third, a third, and a third. And I'm just glad to get to talk to you. And what I am is just a, a pastor. And that's my job. I'm not a professional traveling speaker. Uh, I, my wife and I, we, we've written some things, but those are mainly things we wrote mainly for our own children and our own team at Family Church that ended up getting published. Um, my primary task is not to be uh, uh, speaking at conferences or consulting. I am a, I am a, a husband, I, I am a father, and I'm a pastor who, I, I go to staff meetings, I do weddings and funerals, I prepare sermons every week. I'm like a working pastor. I, I have no Learjet, uh, I have nothing. I fly economy, uh, I drive, you know, used cars. I, I'm a real pastor, okay? I just want you to know that. And with all of that, why don't you go ahead and open your Bibles? to the book of Haggai. Haggai uh, chapter one, we're gonna read some from chapter two as well. And while you're turning there, I do wanna just thank God for my family. And I wish my wife could be here. She can't be here because I have, I have eight children, as Dr. Muller said, I have uh, two that are married and, and out of the house. Uh, one of them's a lieutenant with the 10th Mountain Division. He's serving over in the Middle East right now. I'm thankful for that. Uh, one of them's a student here. He and his wife, and our, their little baby live here. I've got two that play football at Southwest Baptist University over there. I've got two in high school and two in middle school. So I've got every life stage. That's what we do. And I'm really proud. I think I have it. There you go. There's, a, there's our little crowd. That's, that's who we are. Um, also, I'm a pastor at Family Church. So Family Church is actually a network of neighborhood churches. We have uh, 14 different expressions of Family Church in three different count counties and three different languages all over South Florida. Um, we do live preaching and teaching and leadership at every local expression of Family Church, but it's a, it's a network, and I, I could talk more about that. In fact, if any of you ever have an urge to go to a really exciting mission field and you want to serve there, I've got a place for you to serve. I've got a place for you to come and plug in and serve right now. And if any of you have an interest, you contact me and we'll help you do that. And then again, my life was changed when I walked onto this campus in 1993. And some of it's my friendship with Dr. Moeller and others that are in the room, but some of it was just when I came here, I began to get tools um, to study the Bible, to understand the history of the church of Jesus Christ. I began to get tools with which to evaluate the culture. I began to learn that I didn't have to be intimidated or afraid by cultural movements or, or books that are written or, or things that become popular in the culture because I could learn to think critically in light of God's word. And I could evaluate them and respond to them and interact with them. And that was a great gift that I got here at Southern Seminary. In addition to that, I built relationships with professors and other students that, that continue to guide me to this day. Um, and I got some memories, some things that I pull out of my treasure chest of memories when things get difficult. And I remember some beautiful days and some beautiful times, some of them in this room right here. And I hope that you're treasuring up those things in your heart as well. There is a sense though that our world is messed up. Nod your head if you agree that our world's a little bit messed up right now. You guys agree with that? Are you, you probably don't have time to watch the news, but if you ever watch the news or you get your news on, 
I don't know how you guys get news. I don't know if you do that. Is there Snapchat? Do they have news? I, I don't know. But whatever. They, 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 the news is not good. So there's wars everywhere. Ukraine, Ethiopia. There's other potential wars happening all the time. Uh, the politics of this nation is messed up. You guys agree with that? The politics are all messed up. Uh, even our own denomination, our own network of churches across the Southern Baptist Convention is kind of messed up right now. It feels messed up. Uh, social media is a dumpster fire when it comes to Christian social media. And uh, we've got all these investigations and there's all these uh, cover-ups and all of these other things that are happening. And it can feel like when you're a leader in your seat, it can almost feel like you're being handed uh, a dumpster fire to lead. Like we're going to hand you now, we're going to train you. Now you go out there and somehow fix all of these problems. There's problems with race. There's problems with politics. There's problems with the economy. Uh, there, there, there's problems with our own network of churches. There's problems with integrity. And you might feel like you have been given a raw deal being asked to lead in this moment. But I want to encourage you that God never gives anybody a raw deal when he gives them a moment. And this is your time and this is your generation. And you have a fantastic opportunity to lead and to make a difference for the kingdom of God that's unlike any opportunity that any other generation has had in any other place ever before. And I hope you're excited about that. But if you feel, or some people in your churches feel like things used to be better in some other time, things were better before Trump, things were better before COVID, things were better before George Floyd, this isn't the first time that Christians have thought or God's people have thought things were better at some previous time. Let me give you a history lesson. In 957, they inaugurated Solomon's uh, temple. Finest materials in the world, the, the most incredible architecture. The, the Ark of the Covenant was brought in that day. Huge procession, massive sacrifice. 140,000 animals were sacrificed. The, when, they, when they walked into Solomon's temple for the first time, I think we have a picture of it. When they walked into Solomon's temple for the first time, the Shekinah glory of God came down and it was so thick in that temple that the priests couldn't even stay in the building. They had to leave the room because the, the glory of God was so powerful in that, in that place. It's incredible. You can read about it in 1 Kings and in 2 Chronicles. And that was a great day. And that symbolized, symbolized that God had come to meet with people on earth. It symbolized that God was inviting people to come and to know him, that God wanted to dwell with people, that God would forgive their sins and God would heal them and God would speak with them and God would change them. And that was the signal to the world that that was true. But in 586, that temple was destroyed and Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah and he besieged Jerusalem and he destroyed the temple and he took all the best things out of the temple and he deported all of the best people and he took them back to Babylon and this, this completely demoralized God's people and that was Nebuchadnezzar's method. He was gonna, he was gonna crush their gods and, and crush their religion and he was gonna crush their politics and crush their economy and then he's gonna take the intellectual and the social capital away from them, the best young people and take them away and it was gonna demoralize the nations that he conquered and that's what he did in Judah. When 539, Cyrus and the Persians take over, and Cyrus thinks Nebuchadnezzar's policy of deportation was not wise. Plus, Cyrus is superstitious. Cyrus thinks that he's, he's, bad things are happening to him in his kingdom because all of these nations that he's destroyed their temples and deported their people, he thinks their gods are mad at him. So when bad things happen, so Cyrus says, we're going to reverse that. So Cyrus sends 50,000 Jews back to Jerusalem. He gives them their temple stuff back. He gives them some money to get the project started. He puts Zerubbabel in charge of the rebuild. And then in 516, the second temple was dedicated. And I have a picture of that temple as well. You see that temple? Isn't that majestic? You saw Solomon's temple. Look at this. This is just an artist's rendition, but there's no ark on that day because the ark of the covenant is gone. When they, when they dedicate the temple. There's just a small sacrifice. There's just a, a modest procession. The, the, this temple is built with materials that could be scavenged locally. There's no cloud, at least no record of a cloud of Shekinah glory coming down. It's a totally different thing. It's almost like, you know, how it started and, and how, it's, how it's going. I don't know if you've ever uh, thought of that before. So it's not, it's, not, it's not good. At some point in your life, you may feel like you've been stuck in the second temple. You may be faced with economic pressures and political pressures and cultural pressures that previous generations didn't have to deal with. 
Your budgets are likely to be smaller than the budgets of your predecessors. The buildings that you worship in or get to build are likely to be less grand than other buildings that you've seen where people have gotten to worship. Your salary is likely to be smaller or non-existent from your church as you go through your life. The attendance at your church may be smaller than it used to be. Are, Are you encouraged by me yet? Have I encouraged you yet? You guys good? So what will we do? Well, what did they do? So this is Haggai chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Here's what the Word of God says. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag, into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up into the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. Because you know what signal God wants to send to the world? God wants to send a signal to the world that he wants to come and dwell with his people, that he wants to meet with people, that people can come and meet God. He wants to invite people to come and have their sins forgiven and have their lives healed. God has come to meet with people. And these people, we're going to have to make priorities about doing the work of God with the resources that God put in front of them, not complaining or whining about resources that other people used to have or that other people around the world had, but do what they could with what they had. And it's a struggle to build the temple. The first six chapters of Ezra talk about this time period, and they had to either prioritize God and his glory or succumb to the struggle. And preachers like Zechariah and Haggai had to motivate the leaders and the people to get engaged in the work of God. And I don't know if you like to write things down or take notes. I don't know if you guys do that. But I have just three thoughts on this text and on these ideas. We're going to read a little bit more scripture in just a moment. But one thing, I would just encourage you that this is your time. This is your time. Most of us have an ideal picture in our minds of what an ideal ministry would look like for us. I don't know who it is for you. There's probably some preacher or some pastor or some ministry somewhere. And when you think of the kind of ministry that you want God to give you, you have something in your mind. Maybe it's a church that you go to right now. Maybe it's a professor that you like to learn from. Maybe it's a pastor where you came from back home. Maybe it's somebody you only know via the internet or via conferences. But there's usually this ideal ministry. When I was a kid, uh, when I was 22 years old and I came on this campus, I thought at the time like Adrian Rogers or, or Jerry Vines or Billy Graham were these incredible models of ministry. And I thought if I could just somehow be like a scaled down version of what they were doing, that, that would be um, incredible. For you, maybe it's, I, I, don't know who you, I don't know who the cool kids like nowadays, but you know, I don't know if it's J.D. Greer or Matt Chandler or Mark Dever or whoever it is. I don't know who you guys think it is, but whatever. You have these great mentors and models, but I want to encourage you that it's unlikely to be God's will for you that you do what they do. You're supposed to do what you do. You're supposed to do what God made you to do, what God's equipping you to do. And God's going to put you in an incredible mission field somewhere, and you're going to have a heart for it, and you're going to be excited about it, and you're going to want to do that thing in that place more than anything else in the world for that season. And when that time comes, I hope that you're not trying to copy anybody else. Hey, guys, I love the faculty of Southern Seminary. I learn from the faculty of Southern Seminary. Every week I open up resources in my own library for my own study, and there's always, like, I read, uh, I was using a commentary from Dr. Hamilton on the book of Revelation just yesterday. I, I'm grateful for, I'm grateful for this faculty of Southern Seminary. But I've got news for you. When you go to do your ministry on the mission field, in that church, with that youth group, here's the thing. Dr. Ware, brilliant. He's not coming to hear you preach. He's not going to be in the room when you preach. 
Don't preach a sermon that Dr. Ware would be impressed with for Dr. Ware. Preach a sermon that the people where you are need to hear for their time in that moment from the Word of God. And that's no insult to the brilliant leadership and scholarship that you get to sit around and, and talk with and read, read from here at Southern Seminary. But God has a place for you. Hey, we weren't born during the Protestant Reformation. We weren't called to lead during the abolition of slavery in the 1800s. We were not in place during the civil rights movement of the 1960s in the United States. We were not leading during the heyday of the mega churches and the Southern Baptists in the 1980s and the 1990s. But we are here now, just like Zerubbabel was there now, and his 50,000 with their scavenged materials, and he had a command from God and a mission from God to put the glory of God on display to the world. And so do you, and so do I. Move down to South Florida, and South Florida is just a really secular place. It's a wonderful place, a beautiful place, but it's just not. I mean, these people do not speak Christianese. You know what I'm saying? They come to my church. They don't know any Bible verses. They don't know any Bible stories. And this couple came, and they met with me, and they made an appointment, and they sat down, super young couple, they're like 26, 27. And they said, hey, um, we've been coming to the church for a few months. Um, we've become believers in Jesus. And we want to get baptized. We want to start serving Jesus. Um, and we just don't know what to do. How do we do it? I said, well, we have a membership process. You need to get involved in that. And they said, okay, we'll do that. What's going to happen when we do that? I said, I just listened to them. And I noticed that they had different names, but they had the same address. And I said, hey, so you guys, um, are you guys, you guys uh, married? And they said, oh, no, we're not married. We, we moved in together about two years ago. We have a house. We're thinking about having a baby. And, uh, but we're just really excited about following Jesus together. And we just need you to tell us uh, what to do. And so I said, well, you know, I understand how you could be in that situation. But like, oh, why aren't you guys married? Why don't you just get married? And the guy said, well, you know, we don't want to rush into anything. We don't want to make big decisions like that and rush into it. And I'm thinking, like, you're having a baby. You bought a house. Like, what, what you, what's wrong? And I said, well, um, well, yeah, but, like, why aren't you wanting to get married. And, and he says, well, I mean, I just don't want to rush her into anything. I said, okay. And I don't know what came over me, Dr. Moeller. I just said, hey, would you give me permission to speak to you as if I were her big brother for just a minute? And he said, I guess. I said, what are your intentions with my sister? Why are you living with my sister, buying a house, trying to have a baby with my sister? Why don't you marry her? What's wrong with you? And he said, I, I think that's kind of a personal question. I said, you made an appointment with me. I didn't make an appointment with you. <laughs> he said, well, I just don't want her to feel pressure. And I think you're putting pressure on her right now. And I, I don't want her to feel pressure for me to do something she's not ready to do. I just looked at her and I said, if he asked you to marry him, what would you say? Poof, burst into tears. I would say yes. I looked at him. <laughs> he says, well, gosh, I didn't realize that. I mean, if that's true, will you marry me? <laughs> she says, I'll marry you. And then they start kissing in my office, which... I don't even know where to look right now. <laughs> and they ended up going through our pre-marriage process, and they ended up getting married and getting baptized and walking with Jesus, and they've moved away now. But I was just thinking about the fact that that ministry is difficult. It takes a long time. This is not low-hanging fruit. It's difficult. You have to talk people through difficult things. These are people that don't know Bible verses and Bible stories. They don't have a frame of reference for what God's design is for their life. But something inside of them is calling them. And so what is my ministry in that moment? I have this moment. I don't have a time before when people knew that stuff intuitively or culturally. I've got this moment in this place, in this time. We've got we've to take advantage of that. And you're going into a world full of broken, hurting, ignorant people that don't know God's design. They don't know Bible verses. They don't know Bible stories. And you're going to have to tell them. And you're going to have to put God's glory on display in a physical place somewhere, in some nation, in some city, in some town, in some church, in some institution. You're going to have to put God's glory on display in a way that invites people to come and to know Christ. We've got, we've got to realize this is our time. Second thought I have in this, we've got to leave the past in the past. We've got to leave the past in the past. 
Leaving the past is hard to do. If you pastor a church right now or even at a school like this, everyone wants to talk and say, well, how are things going? The first thing out of everybody's mouth is, well, before COVID, well, before COVID we had this and before COVID we were doing that. Who cares about before COVID? Like three years ago, it's a lifetime. How about now? What are we doing now? Let's, let's stop talking about, you know, well, whenever Donald Trump ran, it, it broke all the politics and broke evangelicalism. Who cares? Let's go with where we are now. Where are we right now? What are we going to do today? What are we going to say today? I understand that the past can inform us about where we're headed, but we've got to do it today. And we can spend all of our time critiquing all of the leaders who've gone before us and all the mistakes that they've made. And there's plenty of critiques to be offered. And there's plenty of mistakes that have been made and are being made. But believe me, as you go through life, you're going to lead and you're going to build institutions and you're going to have opportunities to make your own mistakes and have fun with that because at some point, somebody's going to come behind you and critique you. So who cares? Let's not look back over our shoulders and complain. There's so many complainers. Nobody likes a complainer. Haggai chapter 2. Flip flip over a page. Haggai chapter 2. Check out what happened. Haggai says, who was left among you? Verse 3. Who was left among you? who saw this house in its former glory. How do you see it now? It is, not, is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. Be strong, all you people in the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. Hey, that's the, that, that's the voice of God echoing down through the centuries. Work. Work. I'm with you. I've made a covenant with you. I've sent my son to die for you. I've raised him from the dead. I've called you. Work. I'm with you. My spirit remains in your midst. It kind of makes me think, you know, Ezra writes about this. and I, You don't have to look it up. I'll just read it to you. But Ezra in Ezra chapter 3 it talks about how people felt bad when they saw the second temple and how they, 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 they just were, were embarrassed by it. Ezra says, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men, who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Nobody wants to hear from old people talking about how it used to be better before than it is right now. Young people, don't listen to all that. That is nonsense, foolishness, and irrelevant, even if some of it is true. This is your time, this is your moment, The Spirit of God is on you. God has called you. God is inviting the nations to come and to be saved by His Son, Jesus. And you are His instrument of doing it. You are God's ambassadors right now. The Spirit of God is in you. And when the Holy Spirit of God came into you, when you became a believer, the Holy Spirit began to teach you to do and say and think in this world what Jesus Christ would be doing, saying, and thinking if he was physically present right now. And the Holy Spirit of God is in you, and you should be living as an outpost of Jesus Christ himself. The Bible says that you are ambassadors of God. It is as if God is making his appeal through you. What better opportunity could you have? This is your time. Forget about the past. Let the past be the past. Everybody's heard about people talking about the good old days. Well, you can allow the memories of the past to steal your joy if you want to, but I'm not going to let it steal my joy because this is my time and my moment when God has given me this brief window of opportunity. My my life is but a mist. It is but a vapor. It's here and it's gone, and I've got to take advantage of every moment I have for the glory of God. Nobody wants to hear about how it used to be. And these old people in this text— I'm not bashing old people. I pastor a a multicultural church. I pastor a a multi-generational church, and I love people of every generation. But this text, it says the old men were the ones doing the whining. These people were comparing and crying 
discouraging young people. These young people were thrilled. They were shouting and praising God. This young couple in my office that's getting married, they're shouting and praising God. Hey, check this out. So a couple of weeks ago, this couple moves down from Canada to South Florida. Lots of good reasons for them to do that. They moved down from, watch the news. They moved down to, to South Florida from Canada. When they get to South Florida, they're, they're totally irreligious, never been to church, don't know anything about God, no Bible stories, no Bible verses. They move into the neighborhood where we have a family church there. They Google church near me because they have no friends. They're irreligious, but they think if we go to a church, maybe a church will make friends with us. We, they, we don't have any friends. They come to family church. They listen. They've never heard any music like that. They've never heard any Bible teaching like that. They've never, heard any, they've never seen this stuff before. They're, they're totally amazed by it. They come to a Bible study on Tuesday night. Uh, they, 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 they end up meeting with this couple. They, they receive Jesus Christ by faith. They become believers in Jesus, and they want to get baptized. And, they, and then they, they go to the pastor, and by the way, his name's Todd, and Todd's a graduate of Boyce College and Southern Seminary. And they go to Pastor Todd Thomas, and they say, Pastor Todd, um, we've got a problem with your Bible study. And he's thinking, what kind of problem could you have? You don't know anything about the Bible at all. And they said, well, you told us we're, we're going through the book of Hebrews, and we noticed that on the homework assignment, it said Hebrews, and then there were some numbers, 2 colon 1 dash 12. What's the, what's the secret code? The 2 colon 1 dash 12. What are we talking about here? And so Todd has to go through the explanation. Well, this is how the Bible works when you want to read it. They, they put it together like this so you can find things easily. Big, number for, you know, big numbers are the chapters. Little numbers are the verses. Chapters before the colon, verses after the colon. Ah. Okay. So you can, you, can, you can talk about how great it used to be when there was prayer in every school. You can talk about how great it used to be when people were more biblically literate, or you can glory in the opportunity of introducing a new believer to the Word of God so they can read it for themselves and understand it. Which one are you going to do? Incredible. You know, they just got baptized at the beach two weeks ago. I got these pictures of them getting baptized, and they're just hugging each other and smiling and they're rejoicing. So I don't want to hear about the people talking about before Trump and before COVID and back, you know, when we had prayer in schools and all this kind of stuff. I want to talk about the Canadians who just received Jesus. They're shouting. They're excited about what God's doing. Let's not let gripers and complainers steal their joy. Comparisons like that. All, all griping and complaining is based on comparison. You're comparing what you are doing with what someone else is doing. Someone else has a bigger church or a bigger ministry. They're closer to the big guys or they've gotten noticed more. Hey, I hate to break it to you. Um, some of that has to do with gifting. There are people who are more gifted you, than you and less gifted than you, and that's going to have an effect. And some of it just has to do with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God blows where it wants to blow. You're never going to be able to discern and figure out why some ministries really send to get traction and, and some don't. And there's going to be somebody over there who you think is dumber than a box of rocks. And you were in class with him in seminary, and he couldn't even read a word of Greek. He was the dumbest guy in the world. And yet somehow God's just going to use him in an incredible, incredible way. And you're going to wonder, why? Why not a smart guy one time, you know? And, and, and it's just the Spirit of God. Don't get lost, and don't let that comparison steal your joy. One time, Dr. Muller, I was... I was a youth pastor over at Highview Baptist Church here in town, and I was sitting in my office, and a Southern Seminary student came in, and we had a pretty big youth ministry at that time, and hundreds of kids, we had different people that worked in our youth ministry, and he came in, and he sat down, and he said, I'm not making this up. He said, I got one question for you. Why are you on that side of the desk, and I'm on this side of the desk? I said, I'm not sure what you mean. He said, I'm looking at you. You're not very good looking. I've heard you preach. You're not a very good preacher. I've been in class with you. You're not near the smartest guy in class. You're, you're a nobody. But somehow, you're on that side of the desk interviewing me on this side of the desk. And I was th I've never forgotten that moment because the truth is he was right on all counts. And sometimes the Spirit of God puts you on one side of the desk, and sometimes the Spirit of God puts you on the other side of the desk. Sometimes you're in the first temple. Sometimes you're in the second temple. But in all cases, God has given you this opportunity. You've got to forget about the past, and you've got to take joy in where the Spirit of God is moving. Hey, last thing, number three, you have to move forward. You have to move forward. And here's why we move forward. This is why they move forward. It's the same thing for us. Haggai, I'm going to read a little bit more Haggai, Haggai chapter 2, if you permit me. Haggai chapter 2, verse 6. Here's what he said. For thus says the Lord of hosts, 
yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. The tabernacle was great, but it pointed to something greater. And the temple was great, but it pointed to something greater. And the second temple was lousy, but thank God it pointed to something greater. And when the Shekinah glory of God came down that day at Solomon's temple and filled the temple, it was a great day for Israel and the world because God had come down and the presence and the power of God was dwelling with his people. And this, that was the point of the second temple too, a signal that God had come down, was inviting people to know him. But then Jesus comes. And what was Jesus? Jesus comes and fulfills all of the law of God. And when Jesus was in the womb, the angel said his name will be called Emmanuel, God with us. The religious leaders of his day, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and others, spent their time using the law to push people down and push people out. And then Jesus spent his life and his ministry pulling people in and lifting people up. And Jesus made the physical temple obsolete because Jesus was God in the flesh. God has come to meet with you, Jesus was saying, to forgive your sins, to heal you and to bless you and to dwell with you and to love you. That's why Jesus said, tear down this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up again. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Jesus crucified for the sins of the world, and he's buried, and God raised him from the dead. And then he ascended to heaven, and the disciples and the apostles were given the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And, and St. Paul says that our task is to build the church on the only foundation that can be laid, the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. So now instead of God dwelling in one physical place, in one geographical location, there are churches everywhere that there are spirit-filled believers all over the planet, and that number is growing every day. And everywhere there is an ecclesia, a gospel church, God is sending his signal to the world. I love you. I've come to be with you. I want to know you. I'm inviting you to come and be saved and have your sins forgiven and be healed by my son Jesus. I want to dwell with you. And because we have the Holy Spirit, God's not only come to dwell with us, God's come to dwell in us. Man, And then St. Peter says, together we are all living stones being built up into the temple of God. And that's why wherever you go as a journey program missionary or, or, or a missionary or a full-time pastor or a youth pastor or a worship leader or a children's minister or, or a school teacher or a nurse or a bivocational business person who's a church planner, God is calling you to send his signal that God has come to dwell with his people. And he's inviting all people, every person from every place and every nation and every race to come and know him through his son, Jesus Christ crucified and raised from the dead. Man. And in the new temple, there's no priests to mediate, no veil to protect, no walls to keep some in and keep some out. Every person from every place is invited. Come and meet God. Receive Jesus by faith. Be forgiven and healed and born again. We are here not to push you down and push you out. The church of Jesus Christ is here to pull you in and lift you up and point you to Christ. So what about the latter glory being greater than the former glory? Well, in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, St. John has this vision of the new city of God coming down out of heaven, the new Jerusalem. And John makes a specific observation that in the new city, there is no physical structure of a temple. And John says the reason for that is the temple there is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. Because the point of the temple isn't a physical building. The point of the temple is God. And John's dumbfounded, and he says, the God starts to explain to John, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. 
Hey, the later and later it gets on the God clock, the darker it gets, but the darker it gets, the closer to glory you are. The latter glory will be greater than the former glory because the latter glory is Jesus with us. And that's when the latter glory of God is completely and visibly fulfilled. And all of that is ours because we are in Christ and it's all possible for one reason. Because there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. They lose all their guilty stains. They lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Amen.